we have a Reaper assignment to kill five Jads. You might be thinking, does that mean we have to do the Fight Caves five times? No, we don't. However, we want to do the Fight Caves twice so we can get two Fire Capes. One to sacrifice so we can enter the Fight Kiln, and another one that we can use for Master Clues. That's right, today's episode of How Fast to Max is all about caves, kilns, and clues. And some quests. If you look at my inventory, the fourth item down, leftmost column, are seven rock-looking things. Those are obsidian shards. They are used to repair the obsidian armor, which I'm wearing. And the obsidian armor, when you wear it, reduces the amount of damage you take from Zar creatures. The number of pieces of armor you wear increases the amount of damage reduction. With the pieces that I have right now, I believe it's a 45 or 50% damage decrease, and this also affects Jad. So with the armor, he cannot one-hit you, so it's a pretty good failsafe. And also if you use the Tokel Zo, which is a ring you get from one of the Zar quests, it increases the damage you do to Zar creatures by, I believe, 15%. And the Obsidian Helmet acts as a Slayer Helmet if you're on a Slayer task to kill Zar creatures, and there's a melee one a mage one and a range one, so you can make all three and switch between them if you need to. However, if you're wearing the entire set of obsidian armor, it does act like void equipment and give you an accuracy bonus. I don't know if you need the shield for that to count, since nothing on the wiki says if you need the shield, it just says you need the full obsidian armor to get the bonus. I have the full obsidian armor except for the shield, so I'm going to assume it was working. Regardless, it gives a 9% damage reduction and that is worth using. And if you want to use this armor yourself, you need to be able to compete, I guess you can call it, compete in the Fight Cauldron minigame, collect obsidian shards, turn them into obsidian bars, and then make the armor. This requires completion of the quest Brink of Extinction. So the damage reduction against Jad didn't really make much of a difference. He didn't hit me, and I took him out pretty easily. Prayer flicking is quite simple when you have hotkeys on your action bar. And we took him out a second time so we could have a second cape to put in our hidey hole for Master Clues. So here's the loadout I'm going with for the fight kiln. I have water spells, ripper demon, some extra obsidian shards in case the armor starts to break, sarah brews, restore potions, weapon poison plus plus flasks, a melee weapon to fight the dills, 12 doses of holy overload, enhanced excalibur, and an elven ritual shard. I think it'll go pretty well. And I should point out the only reason why I'm doing this now is because I got the jad reaper assignment and you fight something like five to seven jads, I think, I don't know the exact number, in the fight kiln. At one point you fight two at the same time, but it's, it's actually a lot easier than it sounds because you can stick one behind a rock while you fight one of them. So we're only doing the fight kiln to get this task out of the way. It sounds daunting when you get it, but one trip of the fight kiln usually has enough jads for the reaper assignment, and it only takes about 45 minutes if you're slow. People can do the fight kiln a lot faster than I did. I can assure you of that.
and here's us killing Harakin. It wasn't that bad, and I've been using the Ripper Demon in a lot of places at bossing and stuff. It is a game changer, I swear. You might not realize it. It's not even used in scrolls. I'm not even using it in scrolls. It's just, a, it's, oh my god, it's such a strong familiar. It is ridiculous. If you have Ripper Demons unlocked, 96 summoning, the Dagon by mystery completed with archaeology, all those requirements, they are definitely worth using. And if you're not an Iron Man, you can just buy them from the Grand Exchange for about 80 to 90k each. It's pretty cheap, and you get them for about 64 minutes. It's not too bad. But now that we defeated Harak and we have the best magic cape in the game, as of... Well, when I record... I don't know when I recorded this, but right now it is June 15th. And it's still the best cape in the game. At some point, I'll have to get the melee and ranged versions. So with all that out of the way, here's what our stats are looking like at the beginning of this video. Compare to the previous video, if you so desire. I don't. I was doing hard clue scrolls, and one of them told me to go talk to somebody in the fishing colony. We haven't done swan song, so we need to do swan song so we can get into the fishing colony. We might be able to get into the fishing colony without completing the quest, but why the hell would we start a quest without completing it? Let's do this. I remember it was the mid-2000s. I was training Hunter in Piscatoris, but I needed a bank. I didn't. There was no bank anywhere, so I looked at the map, and this was back when the map was... Uh, thing you clicked above the game and it opened a different window and this is 15 years ago So I look at the map and it said there's a bank north of me Great fantastic. I can go to the bank get some of my hunter equipment and come back down and start hunting the things I was hunting again. I think it was birds or whatever So I go up there and I can't get into the place But this guy says he'll give me a quest if I have 100 quest points. Well, here's the thing of my group of friends, of all of us being 12-year-olds, I had the most quest points. I always did quests. I had 100 quest points. It was, it was amazing, right? So I was able to do the quests. And then I told my friends about the new monkfish we could fish. You see, we loved fishing. You know, lobbies in Catherby. Fishing them all the time and selling them for, for some bank. I had a high enough fishing level to do this quest. The hardest part about this quest was getting the lava runes. Because this was pre-Grand Exchange. This was yesteryear. This was like horse, horse carried wagon days, you know? But I got everything I needed and I completed the quest and I was so excited. And here we are again. Hmm. This quest means a lot to me. And with it completed, we can now fish monkfish, which we're never going to do. But we can finish the clue we had. Here's a bunch of clues I did. I got 20 hard clues and one elite. Here's the loot from the Elite. We're gonna re-roll it. Basically the same loot. Alright, I'm not gonna talk about every single clue we get, so let's just uh, speed this up and play some music. Here's the final loot, except for the teleport scrolls. I'm just going to keep those. They're useful. And usually I just alk the staves and the salvage and keep the arrows and the runes. But here's just an idea of what we can get from 20 hards and 1 elite. I realized all these videos on YouTube of people collecting the clue scroll caskets and opening them aren't very different than unboxing videos. I've never watched unboxing videos, but if it involves mystery and you don't know what's going to be inside the box, I could see the appeal. Here's our first master clue. Let's unbox it. And pretty standard. And now here we have six elite clue caskets. Are we going to get a die? Yeah, so there really wasn't anything interesting in those clues, so we're never going to bother price checking it. We have a reaper assignment to kill Gogorovich. I've heard it's one of the harder bosses of the God Wars Dungeon 2 to fight. So I was a little bit nervous coming in, but turns out it wasn't really that bad. You just sit in the corner and hit it with magic spells, move out of the way from the black dots on the ground when they're going to hit you, but you have to move away a little bit further than you would think because they have a splash zone, I suppose. With the Venom Blood perk, you basically ignore the spirits, even though I was still killing them for some reason. And when he spawns other shadow creatures, you just kill them and continue fighting them. And you just got to make sure you stay out of his melee range or else he is going to hurt you. It's quite simple, actually. I wouldn't say this is an AFK method. There are AFK methods. This one is not one. But 
if you have a Reaper assignment, you have to kill about 10 to 15 of them. Don't be nervous. It's actually not that bad. If you have tier 90 weapons, it's pretty easy. I don't know about lower tier weapons, but I'm sure you could manage with a tier 80 weapon. It just might take a little bit longer. You might not be able to stay as long. But you have a 60 minute instance regardless. You could teleport out if you want to. And you teleport to Wars Retreat. You just run to the boss portal and you teleport right back. So it doesn't really matter how many kills you can get in one trip since restocking takes 30 seconds at most, maybe, uh, maybe a minute. If you're just doing it just for the Reaper assignment, I mean, efficiency isn't a huge deal. You're just there for the Reaper points. More clues. We need to finish the Gower quest because there is a master clue that requires you to talk to Paul Gower. You don't need to finish the quest to talk to him, but since we're here, we're going to do it. We did it. Oh boy, here's the master clue. What are we going to get? Oh, double fortunates. Okay. So I got some fortune and components from my scavenging perk, which basically means I need to get 50 fortune and components to use those three that I got. That's going to be our next task. Getting 45 more fortunate component items so we can make an alchemical onyx. I can't remember why I started this quest. I don't think it has anything to do with clues, but we did it nonetheless, and we made sure to claim the extra experience while we were doing the quest, which is crafting agility and woodcutting XP if you have 30, 55, and 80 crafting agility and woodcutting. Since we got the fire cape, I figured it's about high time we do the Karamja achievement sets. We haven't done any of them at this point, mostly because the rewards aren't that good. It's the first achievement set called Diaries at the time to be added to the game. It's so old, when they released Old School RuneScape in 2013, this was in the game. The Easy Gloves makes traveling by boat a bit cheaper, and we can get 40 pineapples per day from Del Monte. We claim the Medium Gloves from Caleb Paramaya in Shiloh Village. We get 10% extra agility experience from obstacles in the Brimhaven Agility Dungeon, and 10% more experience when trading in Agility Arena tickets. We get the hard task set reward from the Forester south of Shiloh Village, and this reward was actually a good one back when it first came out. It was one of the only ways to easily teleport to Shiloh Village, and it was basically the meta for doing Slayer back then. You would teleport to Shiloh Village and get a task from Duradel, later to be known as Lapalock. With these gloves, we have the ability to use the ladder to access the underground portion of the Shiloh Village mining site and to the Gemstone Cavern containing Gemstone Dragons. Gemstone Dragons weren't in the game in 2007. That's new. We can teleport to the underground portion of the Shiloh Village mining site. We have free entrance to the Brimhaven dungeon and access to Gemstone Dragons as a Slayer task. They give very good XP, but terrible drops. So a lot of people like to kill Gemstone Dragons with a Scrimshaw of Sacrifice to increase their Slayer XP in lieu of getting no drops. We also claimed our Elite Gloves from the Forester, so that means we have a 25% chance of receiving double tickets in the Brimhaven Agility Arena double damage against wild dogs in Brimhaven Dungeon, access to the shortcut to red dragons in Brimhaven Dungeon, an additional 40 cooking apples can be claimed per day from Del Monte, 8,000 Tokul can be claimed per day from Zar Herza, one resurrection per day when killed in the Zar Fight Cave or Fight Pit, Lapalock awards extra Slayer points for every 10th task completed, an additional 5 for 80 total, and we have the ability to use the Northern Shiloh Village shortcut requiring 74 agility. And in some poetic irony, we abandon Shiloh Village and the Slayer Masters therein to go to Curadel's dungeon, Duradel's daughter, and get 99 Slayer on Steel Dragons, which were once only in Brimhaven, but are now in many different places. We can kill Soul Gazers, start our Slayer Codex, do the Rush of Blood Platinum Challenge, kill Brutish Dinosaurs, and get our Slayer Skill Cape. We also got 90 Defense. A lot of armors unlocked at 90. Wow. So first we're going to buy our Slayer Skill Cape from... Kurado. What's exciting about this cape is that it provides you with unlimited teleports to every single Slayer Master. It makes doing Slayer faster, but also is very useful for when you're doing clue scrolls. For instance, you can get to Zanaris very quickly to do the elite clue scan of Zanaris by teleporting to the Slayer Master in Zanaris. With 99 Slayer, we can start creating our own personal Slayer dungeon in Menaphos. We do this by capturing the souls of monsters in little items called Ushabtis. We can use the souls in the Ushabtis to populate our dungeon with monsters of our choosing. One option people choose is filling their dungeon with shadow creatures from Prifdinus so they can farm elite clues more easily. I was close to the level and I wanted to make Promethean weapons in Demonheim, so when I trained Dungeoneering I'll have Promethean weapons. So I went to ED3 and got 90 attack. Easy peasy. We have 30 easy 
clue caskets. Took about an hour to complete all 30 clues. Collecting the clues, I don't know how long that took because I just converted them from other clues I had over a long period of time. I have like 100 medium clues just sitting in my bag. Here's our wealth evaluator. Before we open all the clues, we're at 1.036 bill. Then we're going to compare it after we open all the clues. After opening all 30 easy clues, we are up to 1.06 bill. That comes around to a profit of about 25 mil, 26 mil, depending on how you round it. It's a pretty good hour, if you ask me, even though we're not factoring in the amount of time it took to get the clues. It would probably take another hour to get 30 easy clues if I were starting with nothing. So, yeah, you know, this looks like 22 mil, 22 mil in two hours, 11 mil an hour. It's not too bad, but we're not going to sell any of this except for the pages we're going to disassemble all the uniques for fortune and components. Before we did the 30 easies, we had five fortune components, and I don't know why I didn't record after I disassembled everything, but we had 18 items, so we ended with 23 fortune components. Still need 27 more. We're gonna do salt in the wound because we need to complete it to be able to finish the hard Demonheim task set. We're not gonna do that in this video, but we're just gonna get this out of the way for now. A lot of people criticize this quest, I think it's because there was a ton of build-up for it, and it sort of fell flat at the end of it. And the plot line just kind of stopped. Like, it just, it was paced poorly. I think that was the issue. I think there's also a plot hole somewhere in there, but I really wasn't following it too much. I've done this quest so many times, I space barred through everything. I've ar I already read the quest once. I don't need to read it again. You know, I already, I already absorbed the plot on my main, and the main before that and the Iron Man, and I just, I don't need to do it again. Few more caskets, five hearts. Are we gonna get a die? Well, we didn't get a die, but we got a court summons, a master clue, and a bunch of fortune components, everything worth about eight and a half mil. These five hard clues got us six fortune components, so we are that much closer to making our alchemical onyx. Here's another master clue we did. Let's see what we got. Uh, let's re-roll it. Eh. Why are these? These are worth so much. This must suck for Iron Man. I have a new cosmetic override. I think it looks pretty good. I keepsake to Gilded Cavalier, and I got this rune coin outfit. It's like a pirate outfit or something? I can't remember what it's called. Basically, I had a bunch of rune coins left over from when I did one of those surveys ages ago to get a legendary pet when they were like 75% off. Since I had the rune coins lying around, I figured, yeah, use them to make myself look nice. Because I was getting kind of tired of looking at the anniversary outfit. I like this. I like the yellow trim. I like the black. I like the gloves. It looks nice. If you don't like the cosmetics, I don't blame you. Cosmetics kind of suck in some games. But I try to keep my cosmetics reasonable. No particles. Nothing crazy. Just an outfit that would fit the game style. I think this fits the game style quite well. And I like it. Here's a cosmetic they introduced with the newest Yak track, Yak to the Light. It's the Saren Crystal Armor. I think it looks okay. It's not super over the top. It doesn't scream, look at me, I'm a cosmetic. George Orwell once said, good pros should be transparent like a window pane. Good cosmetics should be transparent like a window pane. They should look nice to the person who's using them, but they shouldn't announce themselves to everyone else who doesn't care. June 1st, new month. Let's see what the Oyster has for us. Okay, fortune component, that's fine. Could be better, but it could also be worse. It's usually worse. It's always worse. There are a lot of methods for training runecrafting. My preferred method is with Tears of Gothics. The Yak Tracks usually send me around doing different things, you know, cook some food, burn some logs, chop some trees, yada yada. Right now I'm going to burn some logs, get some fire making XP, try to get 90 fire making. It's a good milestone, I think, getting everything to at least level 90. It's going to take a while to do that with runecrafting. But once we have everything else up to 90, I'll feel more motivated to get runecrafting to 90, and then we can just train runecrafting the rest of the way with soul runes. Anyway, we're here, fire making, with an augmented crystal tinderbox, and it should be level 10 by the time we get to level 90 fire making. We're burning corrupted magic logs because they're relatively cheap, and they give a decent amount of XP. 88 fire making, ignore the weird aspect ratio on this clip, I had my screen sort of 
The, the game was squished and off to the side on a different monitor, so the recorded weird. And now 90. Fire making, we can burn elder, evil trees, elder logs, and grave creeper branches in Demonheim. Who the hell does that? We disassembled the tinderbox and got 102 invention. More clues! Two master caskets. Let's see what we got. Okay, fortunate component, not bad. And garbage. Moving on. I pivoted to archaeology for a bit and got some ancient caskets. It's pretty nice. Over average. Three mil, it's mostly from the pages. Second casket's not as good, and I really wish that message in the middle of the screen would go away faster or go somewhere else. It's very annoying. Let's see what's in these three elite caskets. Okay, trash. Let's re-roll it. Master clue, that's not too bad. Uh, not that great. And, okay, a fortunate component. A Saradoman bow. I think all the god bows count as a failed roll on the third age item list, so we could have gotten a third age item, but we didn't. That sucks. We're capped on resources in Anachronia, so we're going to buy one of the pen deeds, the breeding pen deed, just so we can build it and get our workers to work and have them collect more resources. That way we don't have to build this at a later date when we actually start farming stuff in Anachronia. I was training archaeology in the Anachronia dig site, and we got all four fragments for the archaeology potion. So we can combine it, and we can either learn how to make archaeology potions, or we could sell the recipe on the Grand Exchange. Archaeology potions cost about 2k each. I don't need to know how to make them. I could just buy them. So we're going to sell the potion recipe instead of learning it, because why do we need to learn it? And it's sold for 7 mil. If archaeology potions weren't tradable, I'd probably just learn the recipe, but they are tradable. I could buy thousands with the 7 mil if I wanted to. Can you believe I have more clue caskets? What do we think is going to be inside it? Probably some fortune components. Oh hey, there's one right there. And the final loot from all of those clues is 16.9 mil. Eight items that give us fortune components, so we'll disassemble those and we'll sell the god pages. You know, really, I should just stockpile a bunch of the caskets and then open, you know, a hundred of them. Make it this whole big thing, you know, a hundred elite clues. What are we going to get? And then I can get a million views because that's totally something that would happen. But I'm impatient and I hate waiting. I want to open the clues now. It takes all of my willpower not to open easy clues when I have three of them. It is so hard. I just, I, 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 I want to know. But for you guys, I try to wait. I try to wait. See, I was able to hold on to five master caskets without opening a single one. It's not easy for me. First casket, fortune component. Second casket, no fortune component, but it's still worth 1.3 mil. I have no idea how the hell that happens. Still no fortune component. These master clues are worth so much and they give nothing. It's all of these bolt tips. You know, I'm looking at this one. I don't know what's worth 500k. I just don't get it. This one... Th that one makes more sense. That looks like it would be 300k. But some of these master clues, it's ridiculous. We have two more here. And I guarantee it's going to be... Yep, 582k. What the hell is worth 582k? Okay, here's a fortune component. That makes sense. 1.3 mil. It's, these bolt tips are ridiculous. At least these easy caskets won't give us bolt tips. Alright, what we got is a fortune component. That's nice. I don't know why the black two-handed crossbow isn't a fortunate component. That's weird. Another fortunate component. See, these are so much better than master clues. Oh, well, that... Oh, all right. Well, those... Those, uh... Those last four weren't. But easy clues are still better than masters if you want consistency. We have the 50 fortunate components we need now. It's time to make an alchemical onyx. We have the onyx, we have the fortunates, we have the refined components and the precious components, and we make the alchemical onyx... But what are we going to do with it? Well, for the astute in the audience, you will see I have a teleportation compactor in my inventory. And that's because we're going to make a Passage of the Abyss. And we're going to use it. Yes, we are not selling our alchemical onyx. We are going to use it because the Passage of the Abyss is fantastic for doing clues. For those who are unaware, let me explain what the Passage of the Abyss does. It can store six compactable teleport jewelry items. These are things like Amulets of Glory or Combat Bracelets. With a Teleport Compactor, you could take, for instance, 20 Amulets of Glory and compact them into one Amulet of Glory that has 80 Teleport Charges. It's very convenient. 
but it's not as convenient as the Passage of the Abyss. You can charge the Passage of the Abyss with any of these compactable pieces of jewelry and save its teleports in the Passage of the Abyss forever. For instance, if you used an Amulet of Glory, you need to get 400 charges worth of amulets and use it on the Passage of the Abyss, destroying the amulets. So you could use 104 charge amulets or 202 charge amulets, or you can mix and match with compacted amulets of glory and uncompacted amulets of glory. But you might be wondering why even bother doing this? Just have the compacted jewelry. It's what, you're gonna spend 70 mil just to save some inventory space? Yes, but. Also, the Passage of the Abyss goes by different charges. It starts with 5,000, and every time you teleport, you use one charge. It doesn't matter what teleport you use, you use one charge. You can recharge it, not by using jewelry on it, but by sacrificing fortunate components to it. One fortunate component turns into 500 charges. Here's why this is so great. You effectively eliminate any attention you have to pay to what jewelry you have. With a teleport compactor, if you ran out of glories, you had to make more glories. If you ran out of slayer rings, you had to make more slayer rings. With this, just disassemble a fortunate component and boom, you charge it. 500 charges. You're done. Just add the jewelry you want and recharge it with fortunate components. That's all you have to worry about. Every teleport costs about 2.3k, but I think it's worth it. I definitely think it's worth it, especially if you're going to be doing a lot of clues. And if you're doing a lot of clues, you're going to have fortunate components lying around anyway. You don't even have to worry about the price. It's a great item. So we'll be charging our Passage of the Abyss with Skills Necklaces, Amulets of Glory, Rings of Dueling, Combat Bracelets, Rings of Slaying, and Traveler's Necklaces. These are, I think, the most useful teleports for both doing clues and for general use. A lot of people will put a dig site pendant in their Passage of the Abyss, but I figure we have the Archaeology Journal to get there real fast anyway so we don't need it. The Ring of Slaying is great because now we never have to make another Ring of Slaying ever again for teleports. Since they're untradeable, we always had to make them ourselves, but now we just use fortune components and we can have as many teleports as we want. And here's what the interface looks like. It just opens up each piece of jewelry. You click one and then you pick where you want to teleport. I do hope at some point in the future we'll be able to rearrange the order of these teleports, just in case you put them in wrong or there's a different way of ordering them that will make it more convenient. I think the order I picked right now will serve me well enough, but give me a couple weeks and I'll find a reason to complain. I would like to show you my clue interface as it is right now. We have the Karo's Clue Bag, a Crystal Teleport Seed, the Passage of the Abyss, a Compacted Games Necklace, the Slayer Cape, Archaeology Journal, Dave's Spellbook, the Arc Journal, Desert Amulet 2, Skull Scepter, Liar, Meerkat Stuff, Magic Cape, if we have to switch to Lunar, so to use a Lunar Teleport, and then a bunch of runes. I don't have a rune pouch, but once I get a high enough invention level, we'll unlock a relic that makes all teleport spells require no runes. And I will definitely use that when doing clues. It is a great relic, I love it. I believe we need 112 Archaeology, or 109 with boosts, to unlock it. We're not going to get that right now, that's a while away, but that's definitely a goal worth working towards. And here's where our skills will end on this episode. We have a 2612 total level, so we can join the 2600 total level worlds now, which is pretty exciting. Thank you for watching. Take care.